que, de que tengan no solamente este evento el viernes, sino también el miércoles o el martes, darles otra clase. Hicimos una clase anterior que era con, ¿cómo se llama? Con el doctor Oeting y la doctora Arabin de India, hablando solamente de viscoelástico. O sea que se puede aprender mucho, ¿sí? Muchas cosas interesantes. Así que bueno, ya en un minuto cambiamos, hacemos el switch. Vamos a checar a ver si... ¿Y vos? Está todo... Sí. Eh, vamos a estar en vivo en el canal de Paco Mentors de YouTube. ¿De YouTube? YouTube. Ok. Bien, vamos a ver si todo está bien con Bruna. So we start on time. Hey, Marcel. Bueno, y a ver sus comentarios a las órdenes entonces. Julián, qué, qué bueno tenerte por acá. Shirley, saludos desde Bolivia, qué bueno también, qué lindo eh, entrando. Bruna ya está comenzando, así que vamos a cambiar el, el idioma. Eh, déjenme que vamos a avisar al doctor Hernández lo del cambio de canal de Facomen. Faco. Hi everybody. Hi Bruna. Hi Marshall. Hey guys. How are you? Hello. Okay. Everything, everything, everything ready to go. No everything problem. Ready. Well, welcome everybody. We're gonna switch uh, language. Those who speak in Spanish and want to, you know, have the uh, all the session in Spanish in YouTube. Faco mentors. Faco mentors in English. Dot com. Uh, we're going to have there uh, Dr. Hernandez, you know, uh, doing the translation. So, Marshall, please, if we can start. Okay, great. So, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to some if you're in the Far East, and good evening if you're tuning in from Europe. 
So uh, this is the serial live virtual surgery course we call Stop at Nothing. Consider this an opportunity for empowerment for everybody in the early stages of their cataract surgery careers. So the genesis of this idea for those who have not been with us in earlier episodes was COVID has had a profound effect on education. This does not, however, mean that you're alone. Ophthalmology University and all the amazing mentors who have volunteered their time are here to help you. So what we're doing now is we're going to take a slow, deep dive into hydrodissection. This is a step that's really misunderstood uh, as you're gonna hear shortly from last week's uh, guest mentor, Dr. Jeff Petty from the amazing Moran Eye Institute in Salt Lake City. Uh, so our guest today is uh, visiting, or visiting with us from Recife, Brazil, Dr. Bruna Ventura, uh, who is the head of training at Altina Ventura Foundation uh, an amazing institution. I've been privileged to visit there a number of times. And our, our surgeon instructor in Mexico City, as you probably know, is the amazing Dr. Evo. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, your, your teachers and we'll begin. Thank you, Marshall, for awards. Bruna, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, Thank you. We, we, it's great to have you as always. And we wanted to start uh, with a very short video uh, about Jeff's words last week. So for, for those who, who, who don't know, 10 to 15 percent really understand doing hydro dissection the exact right way. Uh, so I'll just leave that there. We all have a lot to learn. In my experience in the United States looking at surgeons, uh, around my area, uh, there's only a handful, possibly 10 to 15 percent, who really understand doing hydro dissection the exact right way. Uh, so I'll just leave that there. We all have a lot to learn. And so basically, uh, after having Jeff talking about this, um, it was so important, you know, to to give the the importance of, of this talk today. Uh, he was saying that basically 15 percent uh, of surgeons in the U.S. actually uh, understand and manage very well a hydro dissection. So I think it's very important to see this picture, you know, uh, and understand what hydro dissection can be. Uh, you know, it's kind of making fun, but it's like walking on thin ice and with a lot of danger, you know, under it. And this is because it's it's a um, it's a step that happens so fast, but then it, it's so risky if you don't do it correctly. So I think it's very important for you guys to pay attention to this uh, to this step. Uh, we we did some some research. We, we did some uh, search on what, what what do we have in evidence? As you know, we love evidence, and it was interesting that we didn't find a lot of evidence. In this case, for example, this, uh, this research paper was telling us about uh, a group of ophthalmologists in UCLA trying to evaluate the technique. And in the results, as you can see there, there was some variability uh, inter observership. However, you know, um, it wasn't hard to evaluate a correct hydro dissection. So, my question to you guys is you know, which are the components of a correct uh, hydro dissection? And, and in the next slide, Bruna can tell us a little bit more about, you know, uh, about what hydro dissection is. Yeah, it, it's so interesting to, to look at these two figures. And when we, when we see and think about a hydro dissection, you have the steps to follow and the important pieces of the, of the step of hydro dissection in the surgery. So it's like a recipe, but at the same time, each eye works differently. So sometimes you're doing everything exactly how you are used to, and it, it's not working. So what are we going to do um, differently to achieve a hydro dissection that is effective? And thinking about the puzzle, it's a very good metaphor because you're putting all the little pieces together to achieve a, a good step in, a, in an effective hydro dissection. We're going to th see throughout this hour, these next 60 minutes, how this step 
is essential for the others that are coming right after it. And it's funny that if you ask, if you put, let's say, if you name all the steps of surgery and you ask people to, to say, which are the, the key, fa- key steps in the surgery, the least amount of surgeons will say hydrodissection is important, but we all know everyone that operates how tough the surgery becomes when you don't have a hydrodissection that was effective. And at the same time, when you do have it, it's three seconds that makes the entire difference. So if we can go to the, the next one. Yeah, this, this, sir, this study, um, like Ivo said, we went ahead in the literature and tried to find um, the more recent studies. And it, it's interesting because hydrodissection is not a step that people actually stop and study, showing us how sometimes it's overseen. But at the same time, the studies that we have that are, have already been published shows how the surgery becomes more effective quicker when we have a, a, a good hydrodissection. And we all, we all have seen this in our hands. So sometimes we are, we are in, a, in a case, a specific case, and you try to hydrodissect. And if you try one, two, three times, and you make the decision that you're just, oh, let's not bother. Let's just move on because I'm taking too long. And it's not because you can't do it, but it's just that you would, don't want to bother. Later on, you're going to find yourself taking much longer to be able to, let's say, do your chops and remove your, your cataract. Can you please put the next slide? So it's interesting how a good hydrodissection, an effective hydrodissection, it's a very simple step, which usually you take two, three, five sec- seconds max. It's a very quick step, 10 seconds but it will make the entire result of your surgery with regards to the amount of phaco time, the amount of even stress in the zonules that you need to put. So when you don't have a, an effective hydrodissection, you have the, the cataract all attached to your cortex, to your capsule. And this makes when you're chopping and you're trying to move the quadrant to remove each of them, this, makes, this, this generates stress in the zonules. So thinking of the eye as a whole, and the surgery as a whole, hydrodissection is a step that I'm sure you're going, you're measure, if you don't measure it yet, you'll measure it soon and you all know that it, it makes a huge difference um, in our surgeries. And having it reliable, it's good economically also because you're doing it quicker and then not only the step of hydrodissection is quicker, but also the rest of the surgery. So if you have less time that you need to chop and to remove the nuclear fragment, that's all the other the other parts of the instrument that of the surgery that you're um, not spending more than what you need. So if you have a good hydrodissection and then you start chopping and removing the fragments, if you do that in an optimized fashion, you you use less DSS, phaco time, so it, it only has positive um, endpoints. And it's interesting to see this study, it, they, they went ahead and, and looked at PCO and they saw that the amount of uh, PCO in patients, if you can go ahead and for the next one, Marshall, they showed that the, the, the amount of PCO decreases significantly in the eyes that, that had a good hydrodissection and the amount of post-op YAG laser needed was also, look, 60% less. This was a study that, that has some time now. So the technology for IOL has changed for the FACO machines and everything, but every one of us that operates see how a, a, a good hydrodissection can effectively a, a change your surgery, your intraop and postoperative too. That's very true. Great, great. Uh, very, very interesting, Bruno. I, I, I love, as everybody knows, you know, I really love evidence and. We, did, we couldn't find a lot of evidence, but I, I think these are very important uh, things to talk about. Now we, we're gonna have a survey for you guys. It's gonna be very important uh, to understanding w- which is the sh- starting point right now. So I, I'm gonna please um, ask you to answer all those questions. Um, you know, we wanna know uh, your experience with cataract surgery. And let's show me all the no, the questions. Then, you know, how confident you are in hydrodissection. And well, in, we, we really wanna know if you think this is challenging or not, because, you know, we're always uh, used to talk about, you know, capsular braxis, FACO, INA, 
But what about something that happens so fast? And I can tell you, uh, I would like to know what you think, Bruna, but there's so many colleagues that will say that hydrodissection is the last thing they've mastered, right? What do you think? Yeah, yeah it's so funny because um, when we're, we're teaching cataract, we always focus a lot on the importance of incision, which is an overseen step also. And we, we kind of don't evidence the step of hydro dissection it's not a, a step that you're like focused because most of the the residents are like focused in measuring drexis and then they forget the whole part before they forget the whole part after so we're always trying to remember incision makes the whole difference and all the other steps also but we forget to mention usually hydro dissection and everyone that operates when you do a, a, a hydro dissection that's so so you you have the consequences shortly after. Oh look <laughs> yeah, at the that's what I there. think it's that's what I think it's so important today. We're talking about something that you know there is in books is very short. Nobody actually teaches. So first we have a thirty two percent of people with more than two hundred and fifty pecos. That's a lot. So we have people with a lot of experience about how confident they are. Uh, there is a 30% that says totally confident. Interesting. It's very interesting. I'm so word confident, another, another 36%. So there's a few people that will say that they didn't attend it or, or they you know, they tried to, to, to figure it out. About how challenging it is, and they say somewhat challenging, right? And, and that's, what, that's good. I think we have people that they're confident to do it, but they still believe that it's challenging. I think that's, that's very important. So let's go to the fun part now. I'm gonna do a couple of cases here and Bruna is gonna comment. Let's see if I do a couple of mistakes so we understand the importance of this step, okay? I'm with the simulator and you're gonna see me perform a hydro dissection. Let's see how it goes. As you can see there, I can see in 3D, you know, you're doing, you're seeing the picture in picture, you're seeing how much fluid I have in my range. And also it's very important for you to understand that in, in the lower part in the right, you have the injection speed. So we're, we're deconstructing the task in a way, and it's gonna be very important. Another thing is we have a, a chunk annula, as you can see there, it's, you know, it's different. If you see it like from the side and from, from the top, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's try to, to do a hydro dissection. And you can tell me what's, what's going on there, you know? Maybe there is something strange. I'm gonna do that again. And let's see if I can do some, you know, you know what happened there? Can you see it? Yes. I'm gonna do a couple more, but Bruna, what did you see there? <laughs> <laughs> so you ended up injecting a lot of fluid and then you ended up with iris prolapse. And it's interesting when we're at first operating, we don't really worry about these things. So let's say it's a, oh, the iris prolapse. It's a, let's put it back in. And then you, you don't change what you're doing. You just continue and it prolapses again. And you're like, oh, let's do it again. Well, the cataract surgery is a detailed surgery. You want cosmetic results also. So if you have this iris prolapse in your entire surgery, the amount of chances of having um, loss of iris tissue is important. You can have iridodialysis, like you can have the whole thing. So a very small detail that can complicate your surgery and change afterwards the patient's result also in satisfaction. Great, so let's do another one. There is another thing that you know, can be very, very, very risky. Remember the shark, you know, the, after the ice, you know, I put that on purpose. That was not a coincidence. So when you do a dissection like this, for example, let's see if you can see what happened there. You know, the lens, I mean, no, you, you can come in, Bruno. I'm making you suffer. You, 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 you can come in what happened there. So you, you, by injecting a lot of fluid, you, you push the nucleus out of the bag and lift it, which has several different um, possible consequences. So sometimes we do want to have this, this nucleus coming out of the bag, but in a controlled fashion. And we all saw how Evo was doing it with hydrodissection and in a very uncontrolled fashion, this nucleus popped out. 
So every time you have that first, we have the risk of by injecting fluid, a lot of fluid or fluid quickly of having a blockage in your anterior chain, in your anterior capsule, and then having a posterior capsule rupture. That's number one. Second one, again, we had iris prolapse. A third thing that we cannot forget is when this nucleus comes out of the bag very quickly, it can touch the endothelium. So you can have also endothelium cell losses. So it's, you have several different consequences that you can have in this scenario. Exactly, exactly. And if you can see then again, look at the image. This is one of the most risky things that could happen when you have a, a hard nucleus and you're not you know, decompressing and you have a lot of fluid uh, behind the lens. And then you, you have a posterior capsular blockage and that lens, if you can see there, it's, it's going away. You know? It's going to the vitreous cavity. So if you don't uh, master this uh, task, surgery can change completely right in the beginning. So I think this is very important. Uh, also, Bruno, we're talking about, you know, I, I can do another one uh, as well and comment it, but, but one thing you, you should avoid, and this is interesting because you need to understand uh, and deconstruct this task to, to master it. But if you put too much fluid, let's do it again. You know, you're gonna have, do you see, do you see how the iris changes? If you go there and you know, you're just putting too fluid in the back, mm -hmm. everything will, will pop up to the entire chamber. Let's see, because I, I put so much fluid that I, I don't have anymore. No, you shouldn't do this at home. This is for sure. Let's see if I can make it happen. Well, I, I put too much fluid again. If you go out and get in, then you will have more fluid again. Well, I just can't, pro well, I, 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 I did a, a posterior capsular blockage again, but I wanted to, don't do this at the home again but I wanted everything to prolapse. And I think that's something that happens uh, a lot of times, right? And it's a, it, it's a sign for you to understand that you are injecting the fluid very quickly and a lot of fluid, for sure. Yes. So let's go to the slides again and let's talk about it. Let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about what do we need to understand about this, um, this specific um, surgical step and there's three important elements, as we always talk about, that will be, you know, what, what uh, I mean, it's an artificial division, okay? And you're gonna see, but it's important for you to understand that there is the motor skills that you need to do. In, in this case, motor skills are, are kind of in, in between, you know, it's they're easy because you need to put the cannula between the lens and the, and the rexis. Then there's the cognitive uh, elements that talk about decision-making and they're gonna be very important in this case. And I, I did it this on purpose because I think the cognitive and the mental state of the surgeon are very important here. You're doing a lot of decision-making very fast and you need to be in the correct mental state. We were talking with Bruna about this a lot is what happens if the first wave, you don't see it, it's not rotating, this is not happening. Right. What do you think about this, Bruna? Yeah, the the train train of thought, like what the how you 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 think over it during surgery is very very important. So if the fluid is if you're not seeing the wave, or you're doing something wrong, or it's a situation where let's say the eye has adhesions be, between um, the the cortex and the cap, so like some you have to stop, and it's ten seconds that you lose but that will make an entire change. So I love that Evo showed a case of having a posterior rupture because we all know that when that happens, it changes completely the amount of time of surgery, patient's prognosis, lens that you, you, you were planning in implanting many times. So it's something that is a very important step for you to stop, not just go like, oh, it's not working. So let's just, in more, more fluid, more fluid, more fluid. No, stop and think, is it the, the, speed of the fluid that you're injecting? Is it the amount of fluid? Is it the way you're, you're trying to, to place the cannula behind, like beneath the, the, the capsule? Is it the, the, the positioning with regards to equator and border of the capsule? So there's so, so many little details that once you master this step, it's so intuitive that you don't really think of, 
But when you're having a, a difficulty in a case, it's like step back. What's going wrong? Why is it? Why am I not being able to pass the fluid wave? And once you you identify that, usually it's very very easy. And one thing that I wanted to to mention, Evil, is that it, it's not um, uncommon for for everyone in the learning curve to master a step and then think that oh I'm so good at this I don't really need to bother thinking about it anymore. Okay, and then a little bit later on in time you start having difficulty in that same step. And you're like, oh my gosh, how am I? I've oh. operated, let's say 300 cataracts or 600 cataracts or a thousand cataracts. And now I'm again stuck with my hydrodissection. I, I mastered it for so many, so many months and years. Well, it can occur. And then remember us, remember to stop and think about it because sometimes it's just a little detail. We're going to see throughout the this, this talk that hydrodissection is, is made of the details. So something you, you used to do, you're doing differently, and that's why you're, you're stuck on it. That's so powerful what you say, Bruna. It's about the journey, right? And, and I agree. Sometimes you master something, and then uh, what, what is happening, I can't master it anymore. Uh, that's so powerful. Yeah. I, I, yeah, your words are so powerful. And, you know, in, the, in this deconstruction, then again, we, we don't, we don't want to say that in the motor skills, this uh, step is easy. But you know you can master it. You can understand what, where the cannula needs to be in the position, uh, um, and and also the important thing is going to be you know um, the the injection force you're gonna you're gonna have. That's going to be something important for you to master as well. And then if we go to the next one, I I, I would like to talk about the mental skills because you're going to be in a position when you're doing everything you think it's right, but it, it's not happening. You're not seeing the wave or the nucleus is not, you know, rotating. And in those moments is when you need to relax, you need to breathe, you need to focus, and you need to remember all these concepts and try to do it again. Always, you know, with the, with, with the cognitive skills we, we love. Uh, that, that's why I wanted to put it big because here, you know, it, it, this is um, a decision-making step. You know, you, you need to understand uh, what you're doing with what's happening and adapt quickly. What do you think about that, Bruna? Yes, wonderful. And it says we, we talked in the beginning. It's not that you're, you're going to have a, a precise recipe for all the eyes. So I saw that one of the questions was, how much fluid do you inject? Well, it's not X ml of fluid. I, we don't really have that recipe. You inject in the speed that's adequate and in the amount, let's say, that is necessary for that eye. Probably the amount will be different in the next patient that you have and in the other 10 that you have that day. Um, so it's very, very important for you to, to know that more mastering the technique and understanding it and having that train of thought while you're doing the surgery than having a recipe of, let's say, XML. Um, so it's more how you do it, and each case is differently, for sure. I agree completely. And then we're going to show you guys, uh, we, we are so about the cognitive skills, so we're going to even show you an algorithm. So, so we could have an algorithm to, to, you know, to understand what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. Right now, I'm going to share you something very interesting about this machine and something, you know, that may, made me think as a teacher, that is, you have 10 levels of hydrodissection. Interesting, right? So you have 10 different situations to do hydrodissection. And I think this is very important in that process to learn and to gain experience, to gain expertise about a subject. So right now, I'm going to do an easy level, okay? I'm going to do something uh, more relaxed, so I, I, I don't want to... Bruna, you know, to, to have a heart attack there because I'm doing everything bad. But just for you to understand that, you know, um, that, that I'm doing, you know, a decision-making process in, in every time. So I'm going to start doing level one, for example, something that is very easy. And we're going to try to deconstruct this task, okay? So the first thing is about the cannula position. Where to put it? Well, there is a lot of discussion, you know, in which place, but an important thing, and I like to do, I would like then to see Bruna's comments. I like to get be like under the anterior capsule. I know there's colleagues that they don't go under, they do it from here. 
and they all they already know the injection force but i would like to do anyways and i like to to, to, to do like a little, you know, tent, a little bit up, because I think I generate space there. Are you, could you see it? You know, the way yes. pass perfectly. And then I try to rotate it. And if it doesn't, I will go to another place and do the same, you know, the same um, movement again. And then the nucleus rotates. Two things that are important here. First one, every time after I do the hydrodissection, I will just, press down the lens so I don't have a, you know too much liquid under it. Then the rotate technique, yeah, we could talk about hours or that. that, that seems simple, but not. And then in this machine, we can also train to do hydrodelamination. And this is very important, you know, to separate the nucleus from the cortex. This could be very important, important in soft cataracts or in the beginning surgeon. What do you think about that, Bruna? Yeah. Um one thing that you mentioned quickly, and I really wanted to emphasize, is the importance of pressing the nucleus down. If you injected fluid and you're going to re-inject fluid for some reason, so sometimes you injected fluid and it you didn't see the wave, and then you just keep pushing more fluid in the eye. It's very important to remi to remember to release this fluid from behind the lens. So you just very gently push the the the, the lens down. And that is enough usually to just release that from the inside of the capsular bag and decrease the risk of having a posterior capsule rupture. Another thing that's very, very important is you all saw how Evo was injecting fluid through the main incision. And he tried the injecting it at one spot, he couldn't pass the wave, so he tried a second spot, but always through the main incision. Sometimes the, the person thinks, oh, I'm going to go through my, my secondary incision because then I could get a totally different quadrant. But then you have like a posterior uh, uh, closed globe situation. And it's much more um, frequent for you to have a posterior blockage and then posterior, cap posterior capsule rupture. So always inject fluid through your main incision. That's very, very important. And always remember once, oh, I'm going to inject more fluid push down gently the lens and then inject again, no problem. Exactly. I usually, and use how, how, how you, I usually do how you, you showed that it really depends on the cannula that you use. I use regular cannula or the chain cannula and I, I usually go, um, let's say to the quadrant that's inferior, let's say to, to us, so inferior to the left. That's where I usually start trying at like five o'clock or six o'clock. And then if I can't get that there, I will usually go to the seven posi seven o'clock position or eight o'clock position. So that those are usually the two places where if I need to, to try to do two place, different places, I will go. But it's again, not something that's by the book. So I usually start at around five o'clock, but it really depends. If I see, let's say that this patient has a very important cortical cataract, right there where I usually inject my fluid, I will inject the fluid somewhere else because I know there will be an area of more adhesion and my fluid wave will be much more, will be harder to start the wave in, at that point, at that place. So it really depends on patient to patient, but usually if it's just a regular cataract, that's the place where I start. Yeah, there are very interesting comments. Dr. Tim Johnson is doing a comment about, you know, so always sometimes have mechanic, you know, detachment of the capsule and, and go to the sites so you create a space. I think that's very, very interesting. We're gonna go to the comments afterwards. Very, very interesting one. Um, mm -hmm. but, but something I love about simulation, it's this feedback, is this way to, and if, you, if we can put a camera here, we can see what happened. We have this, that it's called a time-lapse that is not only showing you know, right, the metrics, the objective metrics of what you did, but it will also, you know, um, just just put red, uh, little red uh, moments in when you did a, a mistake or where you have something to improve. So imagine then again, learning with a mentor, with objective feedback, and you understanding specifically what, what went through. We, we, we will see the efficacy of what we did, you know, the time it took, the tissue treatment, remember that we can damage uh, the cornea, sonular fibers, iris, posterior capsule rupture. We can have all of that. How did, how did we handle the instruments? And if we had the correct target achievement, uh, because sometimes we, you need to delineate and you need to check 
that the um, that the nucleus is de completely delineated. So that's going to be important in some um, for, for some people, you know, in training, maybe they don't get a good score. And it's because the machine asks you to either delineate and then check it. Um, Bruna, what do you think about this to have objective feedback when you're when you're learning? I think it's wonderful. Um, for those that don't have the simulator, you can always go and look at your videos, your surgical videos. The simulator is wonderful because it's not that you're like, oh, hydro dissection is such a quick step when you're performing that sometimes you don't really see the, the small details. And by having a, an objective feedback, you can easily understand like, um, if you're, you're, you're doing it too quickly and you had a, a posterior rupture, or if you just extruded a nucleus, like it's, you can go exactly back to that step and focus on that. So I think the simulator is wonderful. As you said, it has different levels of difficulty. And at the same time, it's a, a, a scenario where you can be like, oh, um, Evil said that I shouldn't be, be injecting fluid very quickly, but I want to see what that looks like. What, what happens if I do that? Wow. So you can go ahead and you could inject fluid ra rapidly, or you can inject the same amount of fluid that, that you use usually, but slowly, what, the, what that changes in my, my results. So I think the simulator is very good not only for, for the, the doctors to be like, oh, I want to master this and, and be like, I want to do everything correctly. That, of course, that's the main idea. Um, but at the same time, explore the different scenarios. So if I do this, what happens? If I hold my instruments differently, what happens? A very good thing for, for us to be training also is our left hand. For us, for everyone that's right-handed, usually, you take a little bit longer to have your left hand trained. So try doing may, very key steps with your left hand. It, well, it will decrease your score a little bit. Yeah, temporarily, but you, it's a chance for you to train without having patient um, involved in the situation. So I think the simulator is wonderful for that, for sure. Very interesting what you say, Bruna, especially to, to try it yourself, right? To, to, to try to see how it feels, to see the mistakes you can do. That's so helpful for your brain, you know, development. Uh, I, we, we always say that, you know, um, like uh, excellence, it's pattern recognition. That's expertise. So if you can train that and you can repeat the task, uh, it's very important for your learning curve. Even Dr. Rubens Belford is here, Bruna, like congratulating oh. you about, about exactly that, right? About just sharing your knowledge and your experience. So let's go to... To this thing, we are repeating, I think, these concepts, but they are so important about the, the cognitive connection or hydro di dissection, right? All the things that are in your mind in that exact moment, Bruna. Yeah, when you're, when you're doing the hydro dissection, as we mentioned many times already, it's something that's going to be medullar. Uh, we say that a, a lot in Portuguese. I don't know if it makes sense in English, but it's something that it's just, you're not going to think about it all the time, but because you mastered it, but when you're mastering it, or when you in the, the when you're in your surgical curve and you started having difficulties again in hydro dissection, I think these three key points are the ones that we need to focus. So, how are you positioning your cannula? That's very very important. The amount of fluid velocity, how how fast this fluid is being injected in the eye under the capsule, and the visualization. So it's very important for us to be focusing in these three points when we're mastering the, the step or once you master it, but you started having difficulty again, usually it's just a little adjustment that you need to do and then you master it again. So here we see um, the position of the cannula. As Evo said, it's very surgeon dependent how like some doctors, some friend of ours like to inject the fluid a little bit further from the, let's say in the same level of the capsule, but not under it. And that's okay if it works in your hand. Just be careful because some of that fluid can go through the zonules and then hydrate the vitreous and you have posterior, um, positive posterior pressure. So if it works in your hands, great, but be careful with, with the possibility of hydrating the vitreous. Usually we start, oh, um, can you go back one? So usually we start with, like this picture is showing, you put your cannula under the, the, the capsule. And as it was pointed out wonderfully, you can mechanically dissect a little bit between 
the cataract and the capsule to, to get that um, cleavage point and then inject the fluid. Or you can just go ahead and inject your fluid and it will usually just smoothly go around the nucleus and then separate it from the capsule beautifully. Next. And here I love, I think this is my favorite slide because <laughs> this is so very true. So the, the sweet spot of the fluid wave, how fast should I be injecting? That's so personal and it's so patient dependent also. And it's something that it, it, you'll just feel it and, and you'll know how, how, how much you should be in, how fast you should be injecting. But what I always um, advise is start slowly because let's say we see on the far left of the screen, if you start very slowly, very, very, very slowly, it will have no effect. But having no effect is better than having a posterior capsule rupture because you, you didn't have an idea and you were just injecting it very, very strongly. So if you're starting to operate, which is not the majority of you that are watching, but if you're starting to operate or if you're changing, for example, the setting completely, you're, you're going to operate in a friend, let's say you're, you're invited as, a, as a, a surgeon to operate in someone else's um, surgical center to show a technique or something, start slowly. Everything you do, change instruments, start slowly, and you can grow up very quickly. Whereas if you just go and you're like, oh, this is, I already mastered it, and you just start as you usually start, sometimes you go all to the other end of this slide. So it's very, very important for us with regards to velocity of, of fluid injection to know that perfect spot. And it's something that varies a little bit between patients. But start slowly and you will understand how it works in your hands and will adapt very easily. Excellent. Oh, no, man. Uh, we, we, we is the same. I think exactly the same as, as you said. So um, let's go. I think we're, we're, we're in the journey, right? We understood that this is, this is a very important step uh, that is not easy to master and that it has high risk. Now we're deconstructing the task. And, you know, we saw a simple, um, a level that was, you know, a simple task with no many complications. But then again, I always like to go to, to show guys that there's 10 different levels. So if somebody took, you know, the work to, to, to put 10 different levels here, this is because of, of something. Because in the beginning, it was like, why? I mean, that's so, it seems so simple, you know? But then you can understand that, uh, you know, and I would love to understand for you guys uh, the information that it will give you. It will it will tell you about the attachment between the lens and the capsule, very important, the consistency of the cataract, the capsule condition, because this is important too. What if we have a dialysis? We know about it, right? Uh, Sonolar dialysis and the visibility. So then again, I, I, re I recommend you that you're watching here to, to make this image that every time you're going to face a cataract, you need to, to, to be aware of these items. It's going to be very important. Let's do, for example, another level. Let's do, for example, a level three and, th and see how it goes. You know, I can make mistakes too. It's important to, to understand what, what can go wrong, you know. And then again, right, I, I will always like, like to talk about, you know, that because somebody was asking how much liquid we, you should inject. And the question to that, it, it depends. It, it will depend on, you know, on, on this decision making on steroids happening in, in this same time. So, so there is, this is not a, a cooking recipe. You know, this, this is gonna be adaptation. So I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna just put a little bit of the capsule, and then I'm gonna do it. As you can see there, it didn't pass or, you're, or at least you're not seeing the wave. There is another concept I really like is sometimes you don't see the wave, but you see the lens changing its characteristics. You know, it will it will be like, and, and, and one of my mentors, Dr. Garzon, will tell me that you will never know the hardness of the cataract until until you do the hydro dissection because that's when when they show up, right? So so be aware of that. Then we can do the hydro delamination. Sometimes it's not easy, you know. But this is very important, and this is very important for you to train in the simulator 
So if you're having problems in your first surgeries, you can do it. You see the, the golden ring there. So we, we, we didn't have any troubles. You have any comments here, Bruna? I'm gonna go to something more. Yeah, more I, 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 I know that rotating the nucleus is a totally, it's a different um, thing that we could be speaking for so many, so much time. But I just wanna mention that I usually rotate the, the nucleus using two instruments. So one in my main incision, one in my secondary incision. In that way, you do not generate force downward. It's always in the same plane that you're doing the movement. So that's something that avoids, because when you're starting to operate, usually you, you don't have a little, a lot of idea with regards to force. So sometimes you're using just one instrument to rotate that, even your cannula, and you're pushing the nucleus down. And we don't want to do that, especially if you have zonular weakness, but even in your routine cataract, where you want to preserve um, the zonules. So I usually use two instruments and I rotate it in the same plane, let's say, that my instruments go on the surface of the lens. And I think that's a very, very useful tip. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is when we operate using the femtosecond laser, that you have all the bubbles, which make it difficult to visualize sometimes the, the wave going around. Um, so what Evo said, sometimes you don't really see the wave. Stop a little bit and see if the nucleus is mobile. Usually it is. So instead of just going ahead and trying to inject fluid and more fluid and more fluid, if you're in doubt, if the, the, the nucleus changed a bit of, of position, it usually is already, um, the hydrodissection was effective. And I use two instruments, check it out, and then continue my surgery. Great, I agree 100%. So let's go to level three now, and let's go fast. And you can see that the machine will say that the attachment is increased, that the cataract consistency is medium, okay, that the capsule condition is stable and the visibility is good. So then we're gonna do some with the visibility is not good and we can talk about all these concepts as well. But then again, uh, I would like to make uh, a little more emphasis in, can, can we see the, the here, perfect. So I want to make more emphasis in the correct position of the cannula, but also I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to inject a lot of fluid and then just depress the nucleus, okay? This is very important when you're starting, just to be, did you see it right there? We saw the wave, but also, you know, that the nucleus tends to come up. We will depress it. And then, you know, the rotation technique, we could talk a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of time about it, but one of the most important mistakes we see is people trying to do this, right? Trying to just yeah. take it away and not, not understanding that, the correct movement is if you have a, a, an axis that, that is from the sky to, to, to the floor, okay? And this will be correct. Any other comments, Bruna, since we are gonna put the, the second survey for? Yeah, one comment that I wanted to make is the, it's very important for us to remember when we're hydro dissecting to take into consideration two things, the size of your rexis and the size of your pupil. So if you have a, a rexis that stay too small or a pupil that's also small, those are two, two key points that will increase the chances of you having a blockage when you're doing your hydro dissection and increasing the risk of having complications. So be even more careful when hydro dissecting when you have, let's say, a pupil that doesn't dilate well, which was not the one that, that Evo just showed. Evo showed a beautiful eye, perfect rexis, almost femtomade rexis, um, beautiful dilation, but in real time scenario, sometimes we have a pupil that doesn't dilate well or the rectus that stays smaller than we like. So it's very important to take even more care. So the next poll. Okay, so right now we're gonna again to, to see what, what people think about it. We know, we know uh, how confident you are in, in managing the case if you do not see the fluid wave. This is very important again with the cognitive you know, a uh, component of teaching, what, what is your decision making, how confident you are in delivering BSS with optimal force and placement of the cannula. Do you think, you know, you, you manage that perfectly? And the number th three is how confident are you doing hydrodissection with no red reflex? Very interesting uh, questions. Let's, when, you know, when we have a lot of you already answering, we're gonna show the results. There you go. Uh, 
let's gonna see the results. And we're gonna go, oh, there you go. So number one, just show me the, the how confident are you in managing the case if you don't see the fluid wave? Somewhat difficult, 44%. Interesting, very interesting, yeah. When you don't see the fluid wave, this is when the, the mental component of this starts, right? How confident are you are you delivering in BSS and the correct force? Somewhat confident, 56%. And, you know, and very confident, another 30 The rest, they, they find it difficult. So there's a lot of people with experience here. And what happens when you don't have a red reflex? And 44%. And, and, and a lot of people said that's when, 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 you know, when it gets hard. What do you think about that, Bruna? Yeah, I, I, it, remind, it reminds me of, of situations, let's say, when you have brunes in cataracts or white cataracts. White cataracts, usually, you have to, if you have to hydro dissect, it's so small because it's already, like, it's so little because it's already kind of separated from, the, from your, ca your capsule. But let's say in a brunes in cataracts, you have to hydro dissect, you have to have that step there, the hydro dissection. My, my, my suggestion is, Start slowly so that you feel how this nucleus, which is usually bigger than normal, will will evolve with your with your the fluid injection. So start slowly, and once you have once you know how this scenario will react, and then you just continue injecting here. We're going to see some videos just to show the importance of the cannula position here. So we go under the 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 capsule. Injection force is very important. The amount of fluid, and you saw how how fast this, this step is. It's not that we're, we want you to do it in I don't know so many minutes. You're going to do it fast, but fast and effective, and in a safe way, of course. So it's always important to try to see the hydro dissection wave. If you have to inject it more than once, remember to push your 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 nucleus down a little bit. Look here how we go under the the capsule. It's not on the equator. You don't get to the equator. It's under the capsule, like midway or a third towards the equator, and then you inject your fluid. Here, I love how we could, Evo constructed this with Marshall, the different views, how, how he's holding the cannula, how he's gently pushing down the nucleus. So everything that when you're pushing down, it's very, very gentle. You don't want to force this nucleus down by any chance. You're injecting it. So it's much more important for you to have a constant fluid going in under the, the rexis. And it's much more effective if you have that injection of fluid in a constant, um, let's say, velocity, a constant speed, then trying to do it very quickly or very slowly at once. Uh, here again, and it's interesting that this patient has a cortical cataract. In these eyes, my tip is to Try to do your, your hydro dissection away from the, the where you have more cortical cataract because sometimes if you try to do it exactly where it is in an important fashion, the cortical cataract very present there. Sometimes it's not the easiest place to start. So these three things are very key important things to be taking into consideration when we're hydro dissecting, hydro dissecting the cannula, um, where it is, so the cannula position, the fluid wave, the visualization. If you can have a red reflex, if it's a cataract that we can have a red reflex, wonderful. If not, go even slower. And it, all these, this is trying to make this step one, number one, more efficient, and number two, safe. So to decrease the risk of having posterior capsular blockage and the tip of pushing the lens down is very important, very, very important. Exactly. No, no. I think there are videos that it took so, so long to, you know, to edit and to, to try to communicate these concepts, but I think they are very complete. And then they go back into the same uh, concepts we're talking about. Right now, we also have a, a different view of what's happening as we show in the past. We think it's very important for our brain to understand uh, the complete um, you know, the, the complete step that it's happening. And in this case, you're seeing a lateral view. 
L look at where you can see perfectly the cannula position. And when you just take in a little bit of the capsule rexis to generate space, Dr. Johnson was, was talking about going to the sides too, to generate this space. I think that's a very good idea. Some people just go uh, even you know, in a bigger dimension, but always to have a different perspective of the same step. Like in this case, we have a lateral view that we constructed with simulation. And it's so, so good for you to understand what's actually happened. And you, you, you can see there too, all the movements that is gonna happen in the lens. And also that the sonula, you know, can suffer if, you, if you're just doing a rotation with not the correct technique, or you're doing a lot of hydro dissection. So I think these videos uh, are very, very helpful for you to understand everything that's happened. There you can see hydrodynamination happen, you know, between the nucleus and the cortex. So <clears throat> I think right now with technology, it's so interesting to, to deconstruct a task, to understand that there is a correct cannula position on one side, a correct inju injection force uh, in another side, and they're all correlated, right? But most of all, after you understand what you need to do, you need to understand how to evaluate what you're doing. And that's where the real secret is. As you can see there in that animation, you know, fluid, it's, it's passing through, and then the nucleus can go up, and you, you, go, you, you saw me, and you're going to see me again all the time trying to check that lens not to come up to the anterior chamber, specifically not to have a lot of uh, fluid uh, behind the lens. So let's come back to the simulator and let's go to the, to the most difficult uh, steps. Um, I think, you know, it's pretty clear what, what is the deconstruction of this task. And then we can go, you know, to do some simulation again. So I'm pretty sure you're understanding here uh, that, you know, um, there's a lot of variability I, I love, I love uh, for example, I love level six in the simulator because it says attachment very strong. And he says, keep trying. Very interesting, right? So, so the, the person who's gonna start doing this step uh, is, is, is gonna understand that here, you know, the nucleus is gonna behave completely different. Let's see there, let's see if we can see. There you go. This is level six I was telling you about. So let's see what happens, right? So. We don't have a cooking recipe. We, we're gonna try to do what we do. Look at that. And did, did you see that? So the, the, the wave didn't, have, didn't go through, but as I keep injecting, the lens tries to come to the entire chamber. So I'm, I'm just checking it. And I'm really, really, really careful, right? Of how much fluid I'm injecting. So the question from today, how much should I inject? Well, it depends. All right, let's see, we can always see, look, it's, it's already loose. So I did it many times, but the, the nuclear is rotating. And then let's go fast to another one because then again, there is 10 levels and I want you to understand, you know, how many different things we can do. There's one that is my favorite here. There you go, level seven. Look what we have here. This is so amazing just to, you know, um, to train it before you get into a human being. As you can see there in the, in the picture, what, what, what do we have here? Oh, we have a wide gathering, right? So in this case, we almost all the time we have a leukified cortex and maybe sometimes they can rotate with almost no hydro dissection. That's an important tip. But in these cases, we can, you know, we can expect anything. Because we, you know, why that cataract was there is diabetic, does he have a trauma or, you know, maybe an uveitis. So can you see how that lens, it's trying to come up? I, I just injected such a little bit. Let, let's do some mistakes, look. Oh, I did it. That was very bad. So if, if I inject a lot of fluid, did you see that? This is what I, try and, I was trying to say before. So if I inject a lot of fluid, you know, look at that. That's a big problem, okay? But anyways, in a hard, in a white cataract, now it's gonna rotate for sure. I'm not gonna do a hydrodilamination because everything is together. What do you think about this kind of cataract, Bruna? 
usually as as you said the the liquefied cortex makes us not even need to hydro dissect um this type of cataract um so i really think the 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 one the cataract that will that you have visualization for visualization that's more difficult with regard to hydro dissection is let's say a brunescent cataract or a, a dark, like a, a total cataract, but not white cataract. Because white cataract, you usually have a cortified, a liquefied cortex, and then you're done with that. It's it's not a problem. But one thing that I would like to mention also is when we start hydrodissection, we have to remember that we just finished doing our rexes. So usually you have an eye that you're ready, you had just injected a lot of viscoelastic to have that anterior chamber well formed and very stable for you to perform your rectus. So it's very important for you to, before starting your hydro dissection, to pay attention. If you have excessive um, viscoelastic in your anterior chamber still, to take some of that out before injecting the fluid. It's not that you want a soft eye. No, that's not what I'm saying. But you also don't want a, 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 an anterior chamber that's completely formed with a lot of viscoelastic. So it's, it's very important for us to remember, to stop and think, is it, uh, it's an eye that I need to decompress a little bit before injecting fluid? Just do it. I usually do that even with my ultrata. So while I'm, I'm removing the ultrata from the eye, I just finished my rectus. I'm about to remove it from the eye. I decompress a little bit the incision and already decrease a little bit of that pressure inside the anterior chamber. And that decreases the risk of having a posterior um, capsule rupture. Very nice concepts, Bruna. So we are right on time as we are always, you know, one hour we, we just went to hydro dissection. There's a lot of stuff to, to comment. I'm sure Marshall, you have amazing questions there. Yeah, uh, let's try to for them. You're right. Uh, I love how we just move along, keep things at a high pace. And, and the audience was, you know, in spite of the fact we have almost like a 50-50 split of some very experienced people and then some, some novices, but the range of questions are really good. So, uh, and there, some of them are very subtle. So Noe asks, uh, does it matter the cannula size? Are you okay to use a one cc syringe, sorry, a, a syringe, uh, or is it important to have a, a larger dose? That's a very good one. Bruno, what do you think? Yeah, I usually, that's funny. I don't really pay attention to the amount of fluid that I, I have in my cannula. I usually, I usually have around two in my cannula, but I don't really use two usually, unless I have to try again, and then I decompress the nucleus. But one thing that I do is, although you can use uh, plastic cannulas to do the, to, for the hydro dissection, I prefer using glass, glass, does that make sense? I don't know how to translate the, yes. the it's not the cannula, it's the no, syringe. It's just one, one cc, three cc syringe. That what it changes is, is the amount of force, but people get used to it now. Yeah, I, so I prefer I, using the glasses, the, the one that's made out of glass instead of plastic, but it's really depending on what you're more used to and what you prefer. Exactly, so, so, so I think the, the correct question to that is, it depends, and it depends of, of, of the feeling, and that's experience you need, to, you need to gain, and it's very important to be careful but, 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 but for example, if you're used to do a three CC and you go to one CC, it's going to change completely. But if you, if you have that cognitive and decision-making process correctly, you, you will understand that difference and you're going to adapt, right? Yeah. I would also add good technique requires very little BSS, right? So, you know, you, you don't need a reservoir of a leader if you have good technique. So, and once you're comfortable with the force, then you, you probably, as an experienced surgeon, don't deviate too much from your routine. This is a great question. I knew someone would ask this because I was thinking the same thing. It's a Dr. Bruna question about bimanual hydrodissection rotation. So tell us, Bruna, what is that second instrument going through the paracentesis? So it's usually the, the instrument that I use to do most sets of my surgery. I, the the technique that I that I love using for for phaco fragmentation is horizontal chop, and I use a blunt secondary instrument that we 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 call here goatee. I don't really know how to translate it, but it, it it's so the instrument comes here and here it has like a little ball. We call it a golf it's, tip. Well, it's not the golf tip. 
Oh, okay. It's, it's not that. It's it comes. It's as if you you have you know a ball that you hang on your Christmas tree. So very small, of course, and at a, at the tip of that of that um, secondary instrument, and so that's a blunt instrument, and I use it for let's say rotating my lens if I need it, um, elevating my lens to to go in and aspirate the viscoelastic under my lens, and I also use it to rotate the, 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 the crystalline lens. So one other thing that I like is I don't really like to have one secondary instrument for each step almost of my surgery. So once I use my Ultrata, I hand my Ultrata back, I get this secondary instrument and I use it to chop my nucleus, to help me with my phaco, phaco fragmentation. If I have to position the eye during INA, that's what I'm using in my second hand. That's what I'm using to help elevate the lens. So you see, I'm not changing a lot what I'm using with in my left hand, unless it's a special case. So usually that's what I use to do this rotation. In my main hand, I use the Y. That's how you call the, the, the second the instrument. Mm -hmm. So so those okay. are the two instruments that I usually use. Terrific. Um, here's a, a spinoff of hydrodized section. Uh, someone asked, how often do experienced surgeons today uh, undertake hydrodelineation? That's a very good one. I, I could say yeah. that uh, it depends, I, I think, in, in the surgeon. There are people who are feeling so comfortable and they, they love to do hydrodelineation. They work, you know, with the nucleus. For example, in myself, I don't do it anymore because I don't like a big epinucleus, you know, and then I need to take it out with the handpiece and then the handpiece, you know, can have more risk and then the INA, maybe it's too big for the INA. So I, I, I don't use it, but I see a lot of people using it and having great results, especially, especially for soft cataracts. And, and, and then again, this is, I think this is something we could study, you know, if, if it improves or not, but it depends a lot in the technique of the surgeon. What do you think, Bruna? I think I totally agree with you. I think it's very surgeon dependent. I used to do it as a resident, but very quickly I, I started not doing it and I, I don't really do it uh, unless it's, let's say, a posterior polar cataract. So in a very specific scenario, I, I really don't hydrodilineate uh, in a routine fashion. And in soft nucleus that some people prefer doing the hydrodilineation to help, as I do, as my technique for chopping is the horizontal chop, it's for me, it's very, very, very easy to perform it even without the hydrodelineation. So it's a step that I don't do routinely. Okay. Uh, I think this is a wonderful question. Glennis asks, in the, in the situation of weaker zonules, are, uh, how does hydrodissection fundamentally change in the eye? What are the things you would do differently? You need to be more aware, more careful. I will try to, if you already um, identify where, where the, the cellular weakness is, I will go away from it and I will go extremely, extremely careful. Uh, if you think about the, you know, the dynamics of the hydrodissection, it shouldn't be uh, very, it shouldn't make any, any problems with a, with a cellular weakness, but I will be very, very careful. In this scenario, it's even more important the, the effective hydrodissection so that we have the least amount of cortex um, attached to the capsule. Because when we have to remove it with our INA, that's when we have, it's another critical step to losing zonules. Always remember to do the, your INA um, tangentially, not radially. So it changes a little bit the INA, but having a good hydrodissection is a key starting point. For sure. And to, uh, to add something with what you said, Bruno, I think it's it's very interesting. Uh, I, I I know some people that they do a mechanic, a, a mechanic, you know, movement to to detach the cortex, especially uh, subincisional. That's that's the part we struggle the most sometimes, right? So mm -hmm. you know, I, there there are very interesting ideas around there. So I, I think you need to keep an open mind in in, in this matter. Yeah. How about yeah. this uh, question? The, the, some of this stuff is amazing because it, it really speaks to the nuances and the, the subtle details. So someone asked, uh, when you're, you're trying to rotate, what would be the safest place 
to position your cannula tip. So would you start superior or inferior? When you try to rotate? Yes, so you wanna start sub-incisionally or would you maybe err and go further away from your primary wound to create the appropriate traction to, to rotate the lens? So you're already right, so under dissecting and when, where to yeah, go to? You rotate. rotate. I do it sub-incisionally, but I have seen so many people that they do it in, in the superior part and they have no trouble. I don't think that's, that makes a difference. I don't know what you think, Bruno. But. Since I use the two instruments, so let's say you're looking um, at the cataract here, I usually come with my near my main incision with one of the instruments and my secondary incision 180 degrees from there. And then I, I do the, the rotation that way. It's when you're using the bimanual, let's say, way of rotating, it's just important to remember that, say, you, you tried rotating and you're going this way and it's already almost rotating, but not there still. You want to do it again. Avoid going the other way because sometimes people will go this way and then this way and then this way. And then you just keep doing the movement much more, much more, much many times than if you just continue going the same way you started. Oh. So let's say you do it clockwise, okay, start clockwise. And if you have to try again, clockwise again. You know what I mean? Instead of doing clockwise, counterclockwise. Okay, interesting. Rotate. And one more for you. So uh, do you have a preferred cannula tip? And uh, it, how do you feel about sort of a, a specialized J tip or a device to approach from a sub-incisional hydrodized section uh, approach? I already tried several cannulas, and now I, I'm very comfortable using a regular cannula that whatever cannula is, is available. Usually it, uh, the cannulas I use are round, and the smallest that I can get um, at that moment in the OR. So it's very, we have a, a, a viscoelastic here that we buy that have a, has a wonderful tip, and that's usually the one that I use. To, to rotate, to do my hydro dissection. So it's not a, any specific tip that I, I buy. All right. I agree a hundred percent. I have even seen surgeons that they don't get into the, in, into the capsule, you know, they, they're close by and they, they understand perfectly the force and they do a hydro dissection with no problem. Yeah, that, that makes me remember um, evil a technique that was described by, by a group of Brazilian doctors, Jonathan Lake, one of them, Celso Boyanowski and others, that it, that's the second wave for hydro dissection. And it's, they described it for femtosecond laser cases, but it can be used for routine cases also. So what does that consist? Um, we did the hydro dissection, removed the nucleus right before doing the INA, which for people that are transitioning into FACO, requires a little bit of adjustment. We, they, they defended this technique for that scenario. So what, what you do is, let's say you have the border of your rectus here, you go with your cannula near that border, you're not under it, but near, and you inject fluid there, which will do a second wave and detach that cortex and this way facilitate the removal of the cortex in the femtosecond um, scenario. But that also works when you have a, a routine case that was not performed using femto. Interesting. Very interesting yeah. technique. Yeah, very. And that's more or less it, guys. So uh, amazing session. Um, Bruna, I, I, I wrote maybe three little pearls that I thought were amazing that I'm going to steal now. And, uh, but I'll footnote, I won't plagiarize. So that was amazing. <laughs> um, Evo, as always, uh, terrific to, 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 to watch you teach and share your off the charts energy and uh great guys uh so next week uh we'll be back at the same time on friday at uh two o'clock eastern time in the united states and north america uh we're gonna get into a really fascinating session on FACO divide and conquer which i think is a subject everybody when they're learning cataract surgery it's, it's kind of like that first rite of passage to, to really get that down so it should be a great session. We look forward to having you all. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Marshall, for, for all the work you put into this. I want to thank, I want to finish with, uh, we're talking with Dr. Lockington from 
Scotland, and he was talking about these small steps or, or these subtle steps that people they don't pay attention, but actually are the secrets of excellence. Uh, and I think that was an amazing concept. So everybody out there, pay attention to steps like this. And Bruna, it's it's so nice to have you here with us. As always, you know, we have such a great time. We share a lot about this passion about teaching and about technology and about communicating. So we can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you. It, it has been a pleasure. It was funny because when you made the invitation, I was like, we're going to speak a whole hour on hydro dissection. And we spoke over an hour on hydro dissection, and I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know it has been a pleasure. Dr. Arvin, uh, yesterday, Evo did a session on viscoelastic, and she said the exact same thing. When you asked me, I thought, how could we talk for an hour about visco? And she says, but we did, and it was incredibly enlightening. So, <laughs> yes. <you know>, yes. <laughs> Yes, congratulations on all the work that you and Marshall are doing. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm sure it's, it's facilitating a lot, surgeons from all over the world uh, in learning and delivering care. Thank you so much you for, know, for being able is, to be part of this. Thank you. Now, the idea seriously is to, to have a new starting point. After this goes away, we're going to have a new starting point and you know we're going to be all of us better surgeons we, we just need to you know keep the community together and keep talking about these things and, and improving our quality of surgery thank you everybody wonderful thank you